Top 7 Pixar there's no question that Pixar makes great movies. Ever since they first used the idea of computer-generated animation with Luxo Jr. in 1986, they've constantly blown us away with their capability for great storytelling and incredible animation. With a rather incredible average for how good their movies are, picking the seven best ones is going to be really difficult, but we're going to give it a shot anyway. But we have one rule, one movie per franchise, and this'll become apparent why. Now, housekeeping out of the way, I'm Adrian, and these are the top seven best Pixar films ever made. Number seven, Ratatouille. This one might surprise you because it's one of those Pixar films that didn't really stick around much. People liked it and saw it when it came out, but it didn't quite have the staying power that other Pixar movies did, and that makes it quite underappreciated in my book. This is one of the most beautiful movies ever to come out of the studio. I'm pretty sure this is what people mean when they refer to Stanley Kubrick movies when they say every frame a painting, because it's gorgeous. Paris is, of course, the city of light, and the way this movie uses light to bring the city to life is incredible. Remy is a fascinating choice for a main character, and the fact that the late Chef Gusteau keeps popping up as a figment of his imagination is such a curious yet ingenious way of having Remy share his thoughts with the audience. Linguini makes a perfect character for him to oppose, having a character struggling against the weight of expectations paired with a character who is told not to pursue his dreams. From a storytelling perspective, it's absolutely brilliant. And of course, no discussion of this film's brilliance would be complete without mentioning Anton Ego, the critic. He's voiced by Peter O'Toole, most famous for his portrayal of Lawrence of Arabia, and this is one of his finest roles. Even though he doesn't have a huge role here, it leaves such an impact, partly because of his acting, but mainly because of the writing. The final monologue in which he gives his review of the restaurant is absolutely spellbinding, and those two minutes alone make the entire movie worth it. Ratatouille was written and directed by Brad Bird, and that little scene is definitely a contender for being the finest filmmaking he has ever done. As I said, this movie is probably the closest thing Pixar has to an underappreciated gem, and it's definitely earned its spot on this list. Number 6. Finding Nemo Everybody knows and loves the story of the brave little clownfish crossing an ocean to find his kidnapped son. This is one of those movies that just has everything. It has heart, it has humor, it has great animation, a likable cast. With only one exception, you'll see farther up on this list, this is one of Pixar's most quotable movies. At some point, basically anyone who's seen this will have quoted Dory or the Vegetarian Sharks or Crush, the, the, the Stone Turtle. The supporting cast is really what makes this movie so great. They're all likable, they're all memorable, and when you pair that with a really strong central relationship between father and son, what you end up with is a simply classic movie. So this begs the reasonable question, if it really is that good, why isn't it at the top of the list? That's largely down to scale. It's not a giant story, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but neither is it intimate enough to make for a great small movie either. It falls a bit in between those two, and that's what just keeps it from cracking the top five. Still, it does what Pixar does best, making you laugh where it can and making you cry when it wants to. Number five, The Incredibles. This is a movie that kind of goes under the radar for how influential it ended up being, because this is the first 3D animated movie to feature a fully human cast. What's much more impressive than that is the fact that it finally managed to find its way out of the uncanny valley which earlier Pixar movies like Toy Story struggled with. The human face has been a sticking point of 3D animation for years. Uh, to look at Andy, oh my gosh, he's horrifying, and arguably still is, but The Incredibles gets it right. The faces are clearly cartoons, but they're expressive and never creepy. This just opened up a world of possibilities for storytelling, and Pixar took full advantage of that, eventually. It's worth mentioning that this movie was also directed by Brad Bird, who just has a knack for character design, and he really manages to create a unique retro-futuristic aesthetic to give the movie a strangely timeless feeling, despite it ostensibly taking place in the 1960s. But for now, what we have is a powerful story about a man finding his place in the world as the world moves on. Should he adjust to society, or should society adjust for him? Bolstering this is the villain, which was the last great Disney villain at the moment of writing. The brilliance is that Syndrome isn't played up as a twist villain, which basically all Disney and Pixar villains rely on these days, but Syndrome was the last one to have a good evil plan. It was pretty diabolical when you get right down to it, and it's something that I'm severely missing these days. It adds a credible sense of dread that Bob Parr really is needed, which is a nice change of pace. This movie is continually refreshing, and I wish that Disney and Pixar would learn that lesson from one of their own best movies. Number four, we have Toy Story 3. 
And now we've arrived at the reason for the only one movie per franchise rule I put up earlier. Monsters U, The Incredibles 2, and Finding Dory can't hold a candle to their respective predecessors, and uh, sorry Cars, but none of you ever stood a chance. Sorry. The Toy Story franchise is different though, now covering four movies and every single one of them is great. It's rare to find a movie where not only the sequel is as good or even better than the original, but the same is true for the second sequel and arguably the third sequel. Hence the rule, because if it wasn't in place, I would probably have to put Toy Story 1, 2, and 3 on this list, and I only have 7 spots. So, why Toy Story 3 when all of them have a great cast helmed by Tom Hanks and Tim Allen, great directing, groundbreaking animation, and rock-solid writing? Well, it's because Toy Story 3 is the only one of these to have an active villain. While I respect the first two for basically getting by without one, not counting the old prospector, Lotso is a pretty diabolical villain. Yes, he does fall victim to the twist villain monster that consumed Disney, but for what it's worth, he's probably the best one they've produced so far. And he's just one of the great new characters. It was so much fun that Disney finally managed to license Barbie, which they definitely used to its full potential. More great casting here because they have Michael Keaton to voice Ken and Ned Beatty as Lotso. These are just such inspired casting choices and they really lend these new characters immediate gravitas. And of course, whenever talking about Toy Story 3, one has to discuss the ending. Does it get a little too sappy? Maybe, but then again, this was supposed to be the closure to a franchise that practically raised the generation, so it's definitely earned that ending. It's a fitting send-off, which is why the idea of Toy Story 4 kind of struck me as missing the point, which is why that one isn't on this spot. Number 3, Wally. -E. Okay, what can I say about the story of two robots falling in love that hasn't been said already? That, at its core, is a cute and heartfelt movie, but at the same time a clever commentary on excessive consumption though maybe a bit too on the nose with its message. It's also one of Pixar's boldest movies, having the first act of the movie set entirely on a nearly abandoned Earth with very little dialogue. But it's so atmospheric, and despite having very few lines and only the most basic of expressions and body language, they still manage to convey such an incredible range of emotions. It's deeply impressive. You only need to spend a few minutes with Wally before knowing that he's dutiful, curious, but also incredibly lonely and a hopeless romantic. Same with Eve. She's on guard, closed off, and has a temper, but does open up eventually. It's practically a masterclass on character introductions, how basically everyone gets their entire character shown to you, and you get it. After all, film is a visual medium and this movie takes full advantage of that. You could watch it with the sound off and that would barely hinder you from being able to follow it. But now, we do have to talk about the elephant in the room, and that is the second and third act of the movie. It's by no means bad, and it continues some of those great ideas, using a lot of atmosphere and characters with very little dialogue still being able to convey a broad range of emotion. But it also adds in a lot more dialogue for supporting characters who are, while interesting and fun to be around, not as interesting or fun as Wally and Eve were on their own. Fortunately, the finale does make up for it. Eve rebuilding Wally is tense every time I watch it. And the way they manage to make the motions of a robot seem frantic is really impressive. No time to move him 10 feet outside, gotta blast a hole through the ceiling. Yes, Wally is very cute, but the mastery the director and animators display of their craft is something to behold. And that earns it this spot on the list. Number 2, Up. Up is a movie that kind of has the same issue that Wally has. It's too good. You all know that the first 10 minutes run you through a full spectrum of emotions, again with very little dialogue for half of it, and yet it expertly manages to convey how these two people fall in love and grow old together, both the good times and the bad. You could basically roll the credits at this point and people would have the feeling that they just watched a satisfying movie. But of course, it doesn't end there, and what follows is still great. It's very hard to deny that a lot of things in Up are, well, Silly, from the house flying away with a bunch of balloons to the dogs flying little planes, it's goofy. But I would almost say that it's because of that silliness that the emotional moments land so hard. It's called juxtaposition. And Up is basically one of the most extreme examples out there. But it does it so well that it's hard to pinpoint where you go from laughing to crying. But you do it both with this movie and it deserves to be recognized. I should also point out that this is what I consider to be Pixar's most quotable movie. Yes, this is the origin of the Cone of Shame and Doug is kind of the opposite of Wally where giving him a voice makes him more endearing, not less. 
They absolutely nail the personality of affectionate dog, but the simplicity of his dialogue is part of what makes him so quotable. It's not just him though, it's also Russell, Carl Fredrickson himself, and even Ellie, who only has a handful of lines at the start of the film, and yet leaves a lasting impression. There's just nothing wrong with this movie and when the only criticism I can think of is the parts of it that are too good, that means it belongs right up near the top of this list. This leaves us with one more spot to fill in. And that honor goes to number one, Inside Out. Yes, the movie everybody made fun of, you know, Pixar giving everything feelings and then ending with, what if feelings had feelings? Well, joke's on them, this is the very best that Pixar has to offer. The reason why I put this on the very top of the list all comes down to the theme. Yes, it continues everything else that's great about Pixar movies, brilliant animation, well-developed and interesting characters, incidentally, this is the first of their movies with a female protagonist, and great concepts. But what truly elevates this movie is that it has a more high concept thematic angle. The idea of convincing people that you need sadness in your life to give flavor to the joyous moments seems so simple, and yet it's a surprisingly novel realization. And it doesn't stop there. It also makes clever commentary about how growing up sometimes means leaving once important things behind. And that change isn't always easy, but it is inevitable. This all seems incredibly high concept for a movie that has to be simple enough for a seven year old to be able to follow it, and they somehow make it work. This is part of its brilliance, that there are so many layers to it. You can watch it when you're young, and as you grow up with it, discover more and more about it. And it's because of the great characters that Inside Out is so endlessly rewatchable. You instantly relate to Riley. I would die for Riley. They make her easy to recognize even if you've never moved far from where you grew up. And the idea of going into people's heads, see what's going on inside there, is so much fun and that they create all these great locations. The most literal train of thought you'll ever see, dreamland looking like a Hollywood studio, abstract thoughts slowly transforming characters to their most basic appearance, that list is by no means complete, and it's clear that director Pete Docter did not lie when he said that a ton of ideas for this movie had to be cut before going into production. Inside Out is overflowing with creativity, good storytelling, great characters, and a deep thematic side, all of which earns it the number one spot on this list. Of course, this is only an opinion. As I implied throughout this video, we're grading on a shallow curve here. You can make a good argument that any of these movies deserve the number one spot, and plenty that aren't on this list should be there as well. But alas, we only have seven spots, so we have to close this video off here. Comment your favorite Pixar movie down below, and don't forget to subscribe for new videos every week. I'm Adrian, thank you for watching, and remember, Frederator loves you.